think uh, I think we we can we can start. <clears throat> Many thanks for being uh, with uh, uh, with the us today in this uh, special session. Uh, we are online. We have the pleasure to have with us Elena Faranda Carapico uh, from Rea University in uh, uh, Newcastle, U UK. Um, Elena holds a doctoral degree in social and political science from the University of Florence. Uh, where she developed uh, her thesis on European Union organized crime policy. Mm -hmm. She has also she 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 has also a master from the College of uh, uh, Europe, and currently she is uh, Jean Monnet Chair, um, as well as Associate Professor in International Relations and Criminology. Eh? Apart from being also co-director of research for Social Science Department. So many thanks, uh, Elena, for being uh, with uh, with us, and many thanks also for presenting uh, this uh, 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 very um, interesting and urgent uh, uh, issues such as uh, cyber security. Um, thanks for sending uh, us the short article from Politico.eu, and also for the other uh, more academic article that uh, uh, were you helpful to us for uh, understanding a little bit uh, uh, the relevance and the urgence of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the issue. So without further delay, I leave the floors to you. Many thanks. If, if you agree, the idea is to, to have a final session for questions and answers after your uh, lecture. And we must finish uh, some minutes before. Some minutes before what? Sorry. It froze. Yeah, it froze. Some minutes before what? So I guess that we have to, we'll have after the presentation of the lecture, we'll have like fifth, around 30 minutes to uh, questions and answers. And then we'll wrap it up. Perfect. That sounds good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yo, perfect. Okay. Well, Thank you very much uh, for, uh, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the very kind invitation. It's always a pleasure. And uh, so today I'm gonna be talking about, I'm gonna give you an overview of what EU cybersecurity policy is. Uh, feel free to actually interrupt me whenever you'd like. Um, if you have any questions, uh, unfortunately, when I'm projecting the, uh, the PowerPoint, I can't see you raising your hand at the same time. So just feel free to interrupt me. Just say that you've got a question or a doubt. That's absolutely fine. So today I'm just gonna, you know, it's a very simple lecture. Uh, we're gonna be talking about how is it that you understand cybersecurity? How is it that it governs cybersecurity? And then maybe talk about some of the issues relating to cybersecurity. So you might know that cybersecurity uh, policy is actually the most recent security policy of the EU. It is fairly new in terms of uh, how much, in terms of the developments from a policy perspective. It is an area that you wasn't paying tremendous attention, let's say, 20 years ago, and so uh, it has, uh, uh, it, and it has developed tremendously quickly, especially over the past five to seven years. So um, let me start by talking a little bit about the importance of, of digitalization and its benefits. I don't want to spend too much on this because, you know, a lot of the students here in this classroom have, you know, were born in a digitalized world already. They are very familiar with the benefits, even if some of us were born in, in, a, in an era where, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, digitalization uh, uh, features were not that present. So what's happened in terms of digitalization can only be, you know, can only be characterized as a complete digital revolution. Uh, in particular, over the past 20 years, we have seen the digitalization of societies accelerate to a, a very, very large extent. So if you think about, you know, how, uh, um, you know, how connected we are and how connections are being used to actually uh, fulfill 
uh, labor purposes or uh, uh, commercial purposes, it is indeed a, a complete revolution. So if we go back to 2011, for instance, already then 73% of EU households were connected to the internet. Nowadays, obviously, uh, I'm more familiar with UK figures at the moment, but it's in UK, it's closer to 80%. I'll have to check for Spain, actually. So it is, uh, uh, you know, it, this obviously allows uh, a number of features, number, namely from, uh, from conducting business, from home to actually shopping, to actually social interactions. So that really dramatically changes the way we actually engage in, with the rest of the world. By 2012, 60% of you citizens were already shopping online. And uh, what we see in particular, what is particularly interesting is the connection between objects, right? So if by 2014 that we had already 10 billion connected devices and by devices i'm not just talking about your computers and your phones or even your uh, smartwatches i'm talking about everything i'm talking about the cars i'm talking about the fridges i'm talking about um some of your clothes that could also be connected so by 2020 we already had you know the, the, this number the 10 billion had dramatically increased to 50 billion so what we see at the moment is a clear progress towards the Internet of Things. If you're not familiar with the Internet of Things, I encourage you to actually Google it <laughs> and to actually look uh, for it because it is plainly said, it is the future of the economy. It is the future of society in a way. So the Internet of Things is very, you know, simply put in a sentence, the, uh, uh, the creation of smart environments where your day-to-day -day objects are actually uh, connected uh, through networks and they're actually either they have sensors and they're actually producing data, they're collecting data and they're transmitting that data to other devices. Um, if I think about the most, you know, the first example that comes to my mind, if I, uh, you know, if I'm driving my car and actually I have an accident or my car stops, actually I have a little button in my car that actually I press and actually my uh, car manufacturer will know Im immediately that I'm in trouble, that I need help, that I need to actually send this and need to send someone. If the car stops, actually the sensors in the car will actually transmit to the manufacturer that there's a problem with part X, Y or Z of my car and that they probably need to actually get someone on, on that task. Um, but there's many other things. If you think about, uh, so whereas a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, businesses are more and more using the Internet of Things in order, in order, for instance, to actually identify whether the uh, their offices are actually um, at the perfect temperature, for instance, that is actually well adapted for working purposes or for the climate. Others are using it to actually understand uh, needs of workers or needs of the products that you're producing. And there's also, uh, I mean, th th it's endless really in terms of possibilities, right? What you can do with the internet of things. Uh, most people, however, are using it, uh, and that's the bigger boom in terms of the economy. Um, I'm trying to, you know, reiterate the economic side because I know that this class is, is focusing on, on, on economics. Um, so the, uh, uh, the the biggest boom in terms of the Internet of Things is actually not, it, it is commercial, but it's mainly within the home, basically. A lot of people are making, uh, 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 constru constructing smarter homes. And some of them are doing it very, you know, slowly. They're doing it, you know, things such as changing their light bulbs to actually make, you know, create smart light bulbs that can be turned on off uh, by uh, Alexa, for instance, or that can be turned on or off with your uh, with your phones. That become, can be programmed to make sure, basically save energy when it's needed. All that to they actually have, you know, smart fridges that can actually identify when uh, you're out of milk, that can then talk to your uh, phone, to your app that connects to your supermarket, can then automatically order milk whenever you're out of milk in your fridge. So we think that actually by 2026, actually about 130 million uh, uh, people will have smart homes in the EU. So in a way, this is very much the future of almost the economy in a way. So very much as I was talking very much about increased connectivity of businesses and individuals and uh, what we've seen obviously over the past 20 years is very much increased efficiency, increased productivity, but also increased security. Um, and I mentioned uh, just before, so we, we expect for this, for the uh, Internet of Things market to actually uh, really, you know, continue to boom as it has. And at the moment, the market is, is revenue is worth about 4.8 billion euros. It is absolutely tremendous. Um, 
and it's um, and it's also important to mention that uh, um, the reliance of so this I'm going to make the connection now to the cost that this has had for us uh, very much the reliance on the digital infrastructure for the storage of data and the delivery of these types of different products so um, it's uh, it, what's become very, very clear is that actually uh, uh, there's been a need to actually reinforce specific uh, uh, structures in order to be able to actually keep up with this digitalization. Before I actually go and, and talk about the, uh, the downsides of digitalization, so the security or insecurity part, I want to actually just show you this graph, which is by Eurostat, and it's a 2021 uh, uh, Eurostat uh, uh, graph to tell you a little bit about how com companies are actually currently using uh, uh, the internet of things. Um, so this is this one focuses specifically only on companies. Uh, I don't have one for individual households, uh, but as I mentioned, the priority of households is basically smart homes. So here you can see that actually, uh, you know, there's a difference between large enterprises, medium enterprises, small enterprises, and all enterprises. And you can see that actually, good you know there's a very large amount of, of companies already that uh, uh, that are using several types of internet connected devices or systems some of them are also using smart meters smart thermostats as i mentioned make sure that actually the uh, uh, the conditions within the offices are actually ideal for working or actually are uh, you know uh, supportive of their uh, of their workers others have sensors or internet controlled cameras to improve customer customer services Others have uh, maintenance sensors to make sure that actually to track the movement of vehicles. Um, I can give you a very specific example of this one. Um, if I want to actually order something from Amazon, for instance, I, uh, and I have to actually go to the supermarket in the meantime, I'm able to track in real time where my package is and how long it's going to take to actually arrive to my home so that I know that I can actually go to the supermarket for 10 minutes and then I'm not going to miss it. So that's what we mean with tracking the movement of vehicles, of Amazon vehicles in this case. Um, we also have, you know, some companies also use uh, sensors to actually monitor or automate production processes to manage logistics and to track the movement of products. And so what I want you to get from this whole thing is, from this whole graph, is that there's clearly a movement en masse from companies towards using uh, digitalized products to using, uh, uh, you know, internet connected devices and uh, the internet of things in general. Um, I, this graph just shows you, it's also from the uh, from Eurostat, Eurostat 2021, it just shows you where the different countries are. This is still about companies. So the average uh, says that eight, about 18% of companies are using uh, internet uh, connected devices or systems in the EU. And if I look at you know uh, the first uh, Czech, yes, so Czech Republic, 44% of companies are already using lots of these devices. If I look at Spain, 16% of companies uh, are actually using it. Uh, if I look at Portugal, 13%. And obviously the UK is not on this graph anymore. That's, that's one of the problems nowadays is that I can no longer compare the UK because the UK is out of all the graphs of the EU. Uh, but so clearly it, it shows you that you know, there's, there's a clear trend towards this uh, um, digitalization. So having said that, having talked about all the good benefits of digitalization, all the great development that it has brought us there is, however, what uh, Pupilu actually, you know, calls the paradox of progress. The problem is that the more our society is digitalized, the more efficient it is, obviously, but it's also much more fragile, much more dependent. So basically, the more you're dependent on these different systems, uh, uh, the more those systems can be vulnerable, and the more you're likely to actually suffer uh, uh, cyber attacks. Um, so this, uh, uh, obviously, as I, as you, as you might have uh, imagined, smart environments like smart homes or smart companies or smart public uh, uh, environments actually require the collection of very large number of data about the users, about how they inter interact with each other, about their consumption habits, about how they feel, what they want to vote for, and so. The, this collection, the, the vast uh, collect, uh, collection of information and the storage of this information actually you know, creates a number of vulnerabilities that can be tapped on by all sorts of cyber criminals, cyber hackers, cyber uh, terrorists, and external and uh, foreign powers. 
And so what we have seen at the same time as digitalization has grown tremendously is that the potential uh, risks of data breaches and cyber attacks has also grown exponentially with it. And so the EU has essentially, you know, two very large priorities. The first one is the need to protect critical information infrastructures. And the second one is the need to create, to protect individuals and companies. Critical information infrastructures. If you think this is a really wrong expression and you're not sure what this means, it's very simple. The uh, um, critical information infrastructures are uh, what the type of infrastructure that a, any country needs to be able to actually uh, uh, manage its country on a day-to-day -day basis. So critical infrastructures are hospitals, their uh, government uh, uh, buildings, government sites, their um, schools, universities, um, I mean, the list is quite endless. So anything that you need in order to be able to run a country properly. Critical information infrastructures are the information systems that go along with, this, with these critical infrastructures, the physical ones. So if you think about the systems that you need to run hospitals, so the systems that allow you to actually schedule appointments or operations, or the systems that allow you to call uh, 911, or uh, in Spain, 112, I think. Um, so all the systems, all the information systems that go along with the critical informations. So if I think about, you know, in terms of numbers, in 2019 alone, there's, is, there's been 450 attacks on EU critical inf infrastructure, so national ones, with, you know, EU-wide. And these are probably very, very underreported. Obviously, you, you might be familiar with some of the uh, large-scale uh, attacks, WannaCry uh, from 2017, Petya also 2017, Meltdown and Spectre a bit more recent. In case these are weird words, uh, WannaCry and Petya are uh, forms of ransomware. Uh, basically, uh, they are a type of software that was developed to actually take advantage of, uh, uh, of Windows uh, uh, operating system and that actually one is a worm and the other one is a Trojan horse. I don't know if these are really weird sound, foreign sounding words, uh, but in practice, it's a type, there are types of malware, uh, uh, ransomware, where they actually block your computers and actually they then ask for money, in, usually in Bitcoin, in the case of WannaCry and Petty, it was in Bitcoin, to actually uh, make sure that you, uh, if you pay the ransom, you get your computer systems back, you'll get your memory back, you'll get systems op you know, uh, operating normally. Um, Meltdown and Spectre uh, are actually not ransom, they're not ransomware, they're not software, uh, um, they're not viruses, they're actually vulnerabilities that have been identified in operating systems that have been taken advantage of and kind of basically in 2018 there was a big thing that it slowed down the computers so much they became completely obsolete and they actually couldn't work. So I just wanted to put here probably some of the most well-known cyber attacks that have taken place over the past couple of years. So WannaCry, Petya, Meltdown, and Spectre are probably the big four that have taken place uh, over the past, uh, let's say, five uh, to seven years. Um, and you may think, well, has this really had a big impact on me? It's not like you've got bombs exploding or, you know, um, we're gonna get to that in a second. There's also, the EU also needs, very much feels that there's a need to protect individuals and companies from cyber crime in particular and from cyber attacks, um, namely because a lot of the cyber attacks that take place actually are related not just to the existence of vulnerabilities in the systems themselves, in the software or in the hardware, but actually relates it to the human factor. That means that actually a lot of them occur, a lot of these attacks occur because humans um, sometimes are a bit lazy <laughs> and do not actually do their software updates. Uh, so that means they don't put patches to cover the vulnerabilities and sometimes actually provide information that they shouldn't because they're being tricked. Um, you know, most of us have received phishing emails where, you know, somebody says, hi, I'm a prince from a faraway country and I'm going to give you $1 million if you just give me your bank account and a little bit more detail. 
and uh, and sometimes you know it would be you'd be surprised at how much people actually fall for this. Not so much for the Prince of you know Bel Air or whatever he is, but a lot of you know phishing emails where they pretend to be your bank and they make a really good impression, and you think actually yes yes this is my bank clearly they've got the logo and everything is right. This is my bank. I'm just going to put all my passwords here, and so the result is that actually they get information that they take money from you. So the human factor is actually probably the most important vulnerability in terms of cyber uh, attacks. Um, another reason why they, the EU, and this is one very large area of investment right now, is the problematic digital products. So obviously, apart from the human factor, digital products can have vulnerabilities of, them, of their own, basically. They've been built in a way that actually is not fantastic. And so they come with vulnerabilities and uh, until you find patches, basically, you need to actually make sure that they're, uh, you know, that they're up to date and that they're up to scratch in terms of providing the, the level of cybersecurity that you need them to provide. So the EU is very <coughs> much investing now, as you're gonna see, the EU is very much investing in actually certifying products saying, okay, this new product, this new uh, you know, software is actually certified by the EU. It's got the right level of cybersecurity. You can actually buy it. So what is cybersecurity in general? Cybersecurity is everything and it's nothing basically to put it in one sentence. It is such a large umbrella term. Obviously, you know, the term cybersecurity originated from the term cyberspace. And if you're into, uh, um, if you actually enjoy, uh, um, uh, sci-fi, uh, you might want to read the book called New Romancer uh, by William Gibson, because he was actually the person who created the term cyberspace. New Romancer was uh, published in 1984, and uh, it's fun to read because you can actually get to compare what he thought cyberspace was going to be and what we have nowadays. So very old term already, cyberspace, cybersecurity comes from it. And the problem, however, is that it's used by many different people. It's used by IT professionals, by consultants, by lobbyists, policymakers, politicians, engineers, academics, students, and it usually refers obviously to security risks and threats in cyberspace and beyond, but most people are actually talking about very different things and not really seeing eye to eye. Uh, they're talking about different political, economic, social effects. They're talking about different vulnerabilities. They're talking about some about hardware, some about software, some about things that have nothing to do with cyberspace. And so there's really big difficulty agreeing on, uh, on a number of things about cybersecurity. First, you know, three main things essentially, whether cybersecurity only addresses risks and threats in cyberspace or even beyond in the physical world, whether it only considers the protection of virtual assets within cyberspace, and whether it also applies to physical assets like nuclear power plants, for instance. So there is, and one of the reasons, obviously, there is such difficulty actually seeing eye to eye is because there's been a, uh, you know, cybersecurity has evolved very, very quickly. And uh, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, and this has to be said, people have very little knowledge about what cybersecurity is. And from my perspective, because I'm from international relations, <laughs> what I see is that people who actually have to produce policies and create legislation on cybersecurity sometimes have a very reduced knowledge about what it is. I'm going to give you an example, which for me is one of the most, well, scandalous examples in the in recent times. So we have in UK, we have a Minister of Culture, and that includes areas such as sports, but also the digital uh, world. Um, and uh, her name is Nadine Doris, and Nadine Doris was on live TV a couple of weeks ago, uh, speaking in a news channel, saying how the internet was only has only been around for ten years. And you think, say that again, ten years? <laughs> so when you have politicians who are supposed to be legislating, who are supposed to be producing policy and actually encouraging Parliament to legislate about cybersecurity and they don't even know the first thing about internet, it's been around for a few decades, then obviously it's really difficult to get to see eye to eye about what cybersecurity is. The EU does have a definition. Um, it's, uh, if you want to consult the definition, you can actually find it in the EU Cybersecurity Act of 2019. 
And what it says is that cybersecurity means the activities necessary to protect network and information systems, the users of such systems, and other persons affected by cyber threats. So in a way, cybersecurity for the EU is this big, <laughs> very, very wide. It actually, in practice, if we really think about it, it is probably the most transversal policy that the EU currently has, because it affects every single other policy that the EU actually uh, has. So obviously the absence of a, a more clear classification, uh, which you know is related to some of the historical development of this policy, not only because it's actually accelerated very quickly, but also because before the EU was already working on certain areas of cybersecurity, as I'm gonna explain in a second, but those areas actually are very, very different from each other and developed very differently and from very different origins. Uh, this was going to become clear once I talk about the historical development of cybersecurity. And so this absence of classification and, and, and of a specific definition is actually not very helpful because it really means that it's very difficult to operationalize the, this concept. So in terms of continuing to think about what you thinks about, you know, cybersecurity is, um, it often talks about three different areas uh, or there's three different terms that come across, you know, very, very quick, very usual. So, and I want to talk about these ones. Obviously, it talks a lot about cyber attacks in general, but I want to talk about these three uh, concepts, which is cyber terrorism, cyber crime, and cyber war. <clears throat> so, cyber terrorism uh, was introduced by Barry Collins already in the 1980s, and uh, <clears throat> the College of Policing uh, in 2018 actually gave quite a useful definition. It says that it's defined as disruptive attacks by recognized terrorist organizations against computer systems with int intent of generating alarm, panic, or the physical disruption of information systems in order to coerce a civilian population and influence policy of the target government. So in a way, it is the cyber elements of the usual definition of terrorism. And this one is, you know, cyber terrorism is usually focused on critical information infrastructures, so very much trying to disrupt what makes society function. <clears throat> In general, I do have issues with the concept of cyber terrorism, namely because, well, obviously it's a politically charged uh, um, uh, term in a sense that, you know, it is usually governments that consider that something has been a cyber terrorist attack. Um, and and also because it's really difficult to make the difference between what is a cyber crime and what is a cyber terrorist attack, right? So in general, we, we tend to actually, I don't know if you've looked at the differences in the past, maybe in other modules between what is terrorism and what is organized crime, but the way we tend to, you know, in very broad terms, the way we tend to actually define the two, the two differentiated two is that terrorism has political motivations and organized crime has at its basis, economic motivations. So the difference between cybercrime and cyber terrorism would be that actually you're trying to achieve a political uh, political goal. You're trying to actually do a denial of service attack, for instance, on a governmental website to bring it down so that actually you disrupt the activities of that government rather than actually try to get money out of it, right? Uh, so far, there's been very, very few occurrences of cyber terrorism which have been labeled as cyber terrorism. The answer to why uh, is something that uh, you know academics try to you know come to terms with, and the reason I think uh, uh, this is very much my, my personal view is that actually uh, terrorism, classical terrorism, has a tendency to actually have a kinetic effect. Basically, the visual effect, the alarm and the panic, come very much from causing a tremendously big attack that can be visualized that actually has that causes direct harm to people. There is blood, there is there are casualties. And when you conduct a cyber terrorist attack, none of that kinetic effect actually is there. You actually bring down websites, you actually can stop, you know, you can even stop hospitals from working and you will have casualties, but they are not mass casualties. There is no panic effect as such. So I think that so far, um, because of the type of technology that exists, cyber terrorism hasn't really been used as much. Cyber crime is, now thinking, moving on to cyber crime, cyber crime is actually the most 
important area of, uh, of, uh, of cyber insecurity that we have in the EU. It is by far the most important one. It is the one that actually, you know, that, uh, that affects most people, basically. And cybercrime is very much a set of specific crimes that relate to the usage of computers and electronic networks. So there's essentially two forms of cybercrime. The first type is when you actually facilitate crimes that have already, always existed through digital means, and that is, for instance, fraud, for instance. So you facilitate the, uh, you know, you try to commit fraud, but you do it digitally. And another form of cybercrime is activities that rely entirely on information networks. So basically, when you actually create a virus and you actually uh, infiltrate a specific, or you create a Trojan horse and you infiltrate a computer, that was not, you know, that was not possible before, you know, information networks existed. So essentially, you know, you've got four types of offenses in cybercrime. You've got, you know, offenses against computer data and systems. That's kind of hacking a computer, right? Computer forgery and fraud. When you, you know, you get phishing emails. When you get malware. Content offenses like disseminating child abuse images. And then you've got copyright offenses when you illegally download music or videos, which I'm sure everyone here has done. Uh, <clears throat> and the causes of cybercrime are very much, and I'm going to try and accelerate now uh, the class so that we actually finish by uh, 9, what, 9.30 me, 10.30 yours. Um, and we have half an hour still for, for questions. Um, so in terms of the causes, very much, obviously, technological development. The technology is there. It's actually becoming cheaper to actually access the internet. It's even possible to access internet. I just... Sorry, I'm going to just close my email because obviously I'm getting a lot of emails and uh, there you go. Uh, you should be seeing the, 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 the PowerPoint again. So it's become much cheaper to actually obviously access the internet. You don't have, to, you don't need a computer. You can just, you know, use your phone and it's actually uh, packages of accessing uh, internet are much cheaper. Um, it's uh, obviously there's the, also the increased dependence I've already talked about, of governments, of individuals, of companies. So actually, you know, there's a lot more vulnerabilities that you can actually access. It's also really uh, uh, difficult to actually ascertain who actually commits cybercrime. There's the issue of anonymity. And in general, there's the issue of lack of knowledge on the user side to protect themselves, how to best you know, protect themselves. How can they make sure that actually their computers actually have the right software with the right patches and not, are not vulnerable to cyber attacks? Um, in terms of what's happening currently in cybercrime, just to give you a little bit of the trends, um, what we've seen over the past maybe you know five years is very much that uh, we've gone from a very passive type of cybercrime to a much more aggressive. That means a lot more usage of ransomware. So basically, uh, using uh, worms to uh, that actually self-replicate uh, in your computer, or using Trojan horses, which means that you maybe get a file and you open the file because you think that it comes from a trusted source. And then suddenly you've got ransomware in your computer that is actually locking your files and you can't access uh, access them and you you're being asked to pay something to be able to actually get your computer back. Um, we're also seeing something that is really interesting is that criminals no longer need to have knowledge about cybersecurity in order to actually do cyber attacks. You don't have to have any knowledge anymore because actually we went from what we used to you know consider to be like the, the hackers that was specialized that had a lot of knowledge to crime as a service model. That means that you basically go to the supermarkets uh, uh, of the, <laughs> of the uh, crime world and you actually just get a package that says, you know, virus A, and that you, you can just, you know, run it like a software and that's it, you're in business. You don't need to know, you don't need to produce that software, you don't need to know how it works, you just need to actually run it because you brought it like a product essentially. Um, very much the focus has been data, basically. It's not about the money, it's really, data is actually the most interesting product. Uh, there's been a lot more credit card frauds. Uh, there's been a lot more child sexual exploitation online. Uh, one thing that's been very, very common is CEO frauds. That's a really interesting one. Uh, basically, heads of companies actually being uh, hijacked out of their computers with people who have studied their habits and actually pretend to be them online and then hijacked the, uh, a, lot, a lot of their data. The point being about the trends on, in cybercrime is very much that actually it's not about whether it's going to happen, it's about when it's going to happen. They are absolutely inevitable. You know, you will always have cyber uh, criminals trying to actually get the upper hands, actually trying to identify vulnerabilities in hardware and software and trying to actually use it to their own advantage. So 
the only way is actually prevention and resilience. Resilience in cybersecurity means that you have to have a lot of backups. So imagine that you're flying a plane, and obviously, if you know uh, if something goes wrong with the plane, you have other backup systems, right? The plane is not going to crash just because one system's down. With cybersecurity, it's exactly the same. What is important is how quickly can you get this back up, basically? How quickly, if there's a cyber attack on a specific uh, critical information infrastructure, like uh, energy company, for instance, that serves a really large part of the population, how quickly can that company get the electricity back on? It's good. Is it going to take five hours or is it going to take five minutes? That's resilience, essentially. So essentially, cybercrime is very much an elastic and, and quite controversial concept. It's controversial because no one really, you know, obviously everyone has this idea that actually it is the most important area of uh, vulnerability that we have in society and uh, that obviously it's harming companies, individuals, governments, but at the same time, no one really knows how much it's really costing us, essentially because the way it's calculated depends on who you're asking. So a lot of the people who calculate the cost of cybercrime are actually companies like Norton, for instance. Uh, but if you ask a government, probably you're going to end up with a very different calculation. Uh, there's also the issue that actually most of cybercrime goes completely unreported. I probably get phishing emails like on a regular basis, like once a week, for instance. Am I going to open those phishing emails? Well, hopefully not. Um, but how many of you have received phishing emails from the, uh, you know, the uh, Prince of Bel Air? And obviously, are you going to report that to the police? Probably not. You're just going to ignore it and just delete it, right? Um, and there's also the issue that there's always been traditionally quite a low number of effective convictions because, well, anonymity, so difficult to actually get convictions. Cyber war um, is actually a really interesting concept, especially in the current climate. Yes, I'm talking about Ukraine now. Um, so it's a very elusive concept, uh, and mainly because it actually shares very little similarities with kinetic war, so physical warfare. Um, I've got a colleague, his name is Thomas, Thomas Ritz, and I've got a, uh, a sentence here from him uh, that says that cybercrime has never happened in the past, it does not occur in the present, and it's highly unlikely that it will disturb our future. I have this discussion with Thomas, I'm afraid I don't agree with Thomas. Uh, I think that cyber warfare does exist and it is happening right now. It has happened for a long time. It is, however, very different from you know, physical warfare, right? You don't have bombs falling, etc. What you do have with cyber war is actually that cyber warfare is often used alongside physical warfare. So if we think about the uh, example that just happened recently, obviously you've got examples happening every day, but if I think about Ukraine, obviously the day before Russia invaded Ukraine, actually there was a specific cyber attack on a um, on a telecommunication company, on a Ukrainian telecommunication company, and that brought down a lot of the communications, and that actually hampered the military, uh, you know, response on the Ukrainian side, but also affected, you know, companies and individuals, not just in Ukraine actually, much beyond Ukraine, that also dependent on that company. So in a way it reduced the capacity of that country and other countries to actually respond to a specific uh, physical invasion that was gonna come. So in a way, cyber warfare for me is an instrument that goes alongside cyber, uh, uh, that goes along warfare, physical warfare, because it helps the warfare effort. Cyber warfare focuses mainly on attacks on military and critical information infrastructures and uses denial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks. That means that you actually overwhelm servers and bring down specific websites of governments, for instance, but also malware and all sorts of viruses. There's all different forms of, of, of you know, ways of actually creating cyber warfare. And obviously cyber warfare is cyber warfare when it's labeled as such by specific governments. And so you do have examples where governments have said, this has been an act of cyber warfare. Estonia in 2007 is one of them. Georgia, 2008, so both of them attacked by Russia officially. Uh, Iran uh, in 2009 with the Stuxnet attack on the Natanz uh, nuclear power plants that slowed down the production of uh, enriched uranium. That one is 
not officially, but most people know it's been the U it was the US and Israel, uh, the attack on the US in 2015 by Al Qaeda at the time, uh, bringing down a number of governmental websites. Uh, and then obviously the 2022 um, case of Ukraine plus, and I say Ukraine plus because it not only affected Ukraine, it affected quite a lot of European countries as well. Um, so in terms of perceptions, just to finish this part, um, American and EU perceptions. So what I thought was, what I think is interesting trying to compare the Americans and, and the EU perceptions is that actually everyone's on the same page. So if I think about Obama in 2015, when, you know, he was already very clear, we need to accelerate collective efforts to increase our nation's cybersecurity to preserve and protect our core values as a nation. So super important. 2013, the EU, more or less at the same time, cyber criminals are using ever more sophisticated methods for intruding into information systems. The increase of economic espionage and space-sponsored activities in cyberspace poses a new category of threats for EU governments and companies. So super, super important, very much top of the priority at the moment. The problem is, however, that perception doesn't always mean implementation, right? So things don't often go hand in hand. And that's one of the issues I want to bring up at a later stage in this uh, presentation. Um, so how does the EU govern cybersecurity? So the, uh, so, so I'm just gonna very quickly go over some of the instruments that the EU has. So although I mentioned that cybersecurity is a very recent policy, what I mean is a policy that is called a cybersecurity policy. That doesn't mean that before 2013, when the EU cybersecurity policy was created officially, that doesn't mean that you hasn't you know, had concerns with cybersecurity. It has for a long, long time. In fact, if we go back to the 1980s, we can see that actually at the time, the, EU, the commission was already talking about what it called computer crime or e-crime, right? So electronic crime. So at the time it was already very interested in how, uh, you know, uh, espionage using floppy disks. You might not know what a floppy disk anymore is, but um, it, there were these disks that you could actually get into computers and actually you could download, <laughs> you could put you know, files into it. And uh, at the time when we actually still put, you know, plug things into computers. Um, and so the commission was very, very you know, concerned with espionage using floppy disks at the time. And it was thinking, what can we do to actually protect the common market. So it was very much the whole thing started because the commission was worried about economic issues, the impact of electronic crime, of computer crime on the development of the single market. Uh, with uh, the emergence of, uh, of other forms of cyber crime, the commission started to think actually, uh, we might have another issue here. Maybe it's not just about the economics. Maybe it's not just about the development of the single market. Maybe it's actually about the protection of individuals, of their livelihoods, of their, their lives in general, and how this is actually harming individuals. So you can see that actually at the end of the 1990s, we start to transition to a security rationale. We go from economics to actually this is more of a security issue. And a very, very important turn happens in 2004 and 2005, in particular because of Spain. Spain and UK because of the terrorist attacks that actually took place in both countries. And so what those, from a cybersecurity perspective, what those events actually made, what the consequences that had in terms of cybersecurity is that the EU started to think about the impact that attacks could have on critical infrastructures, information infrastructures, but also physical infrastructures. And it started to think that actually this needed to be about the protection of citizens, not just companies, but also citizens and critical infrastructures, the protection of society itself. That technology was evolving so quickly that actually we were becoming vulnerable, very vulnerable to all sorts of attacks. And so cybersecurity really becomes a priority from those attacks onwards. And it becomes, you know, between 2005 and 2013, what we see is the EU started to start talking a lot about cybersecurity, start to think about, you know, what kind of policies it could put in place, instruments, institutions, uh, what kind of instru instruments it could actually do to actually uh, create to tackle cyber insecurity. And the, the driver very much of this development between 2005 and 2013 is the idea that actually the EU was really well placed to coordinate this. It's not that you wanted to take the, the, the role of the, uh, of the countries. Obviously, cybersecurity is something that countries are in the driving seat of. It doesn't want to actually replace the governments. What it wants to do is coordinate the action of the countries because very plainly put, 
there are no borders in cyberspace, right? So there is no possibility of policing your cyberspace separately from the cyberspace of the country next door, right? So the EU is really well placed to actually look at transnational problems and cybersecurity is very much one of them. So in 2013, there is a uh, very much uh, the first cybersecurity strategy, and this is like the start of the cybersecurity policy, where you've got DG Home, DG Connect, and DG Just within the Commission getting together and actually saying, uh, and European External Action Service getting together and say, we have to create a coherent strategy because we're all doing different things in the area of cybersecurity. We're all doing our own little thing. We need to be much more coherent. We need to start talking to each other. We need to actually create a comprehensive response. And so they create a response that has three pillars. And those three pillars are still very much the core of what cybersecurity policy looks like. The first core pillar is law enforcement, that's cybercrime, that's what the police does. The second pillar is network and information security, that deals with attacks on critical information infrastructure, that's what ENISA does, which is the uh, European Union's uh, cybersecurity agency. And then you've got external relations and defense, which is cyber defense, essentially. That's what uh, the uh, European Defense Agency does, the external action service does. And then you, nowadays you have a fourth pillar, which has been added so far, which is cyber diplomacy, so external relations. And the interesting thing is that you had three main actors as part of this strategy. You had member states, you had EU institutions, and very importantly, you have the private sector. And if you're wondering why is the private sector involved in all of this, the answer is really simple. If you think about who actually owns most of the critical information infrastructures, the answer is the private sector. Most of the critical information infrastructures, the things that are needed for the countries to run, actually are not in the hands of the public sector. They are uh, energy companies, water companies, they are... Um, nuclear power plants, they are all in the hands, telecommunication uh, uh, companies, they're all in the hands of the private sector. So you need the private sector to be on the same level in terms of sharing the same vision of what cybersecurity should look like, right? So this is what cybersecurity policy looks like at the moment. So you've got the three pillars, the original three pillars, so the law enforcement one, the network information security one, and defense one. And you've got the EU level, and then you've got the national level. And then you have a lot of actors, a lot of actors. So mostly the most important one in law enforcement is Europol and the EC3, which is European uh, well, Cybercrime Agency, uh, uh, European Cybercrime Unit within Europol. Uh, you've got ENISA working on network and information security. So that's European uh, uh, Agency for Cybersecurity. You've got the European External Action Service in defense together with European Defense Agency. And then at national level, we have also very large multiplication of actors. You might be starting to think where I'm going with this, right? Many actors all coming from very different fields. Sometimes this doesn't really work very well together. In terms of what's been happening lately, uh, just before I go into the problems, um, there's been quite, a, as I mentioned, there's been a huge, huge acceleration of cybersecurity. So the most recent changes is we now have a new cybersecurity strategy that replaced the 2013 one. Focus continues to be on critical information infrastructures, internet of things, cyber diplomacy, and creating internal coherence. So not very different from the 2013 one. We've got more emphasis on coherence with the uh, Network and Information uh, Service Directive number two of 2020. Uh, the idea of this directive is to create more national uh, cybersecurity bodies, making sure that everyone is seeing eye to eye because maybe Greece doesn't think that actually it should invest that much money because maybe it doesn't have as much money to invest as you know the Netherlands. Um, the idea is to create also a joint cyber unit, which has been uh, proposed in 2021 to actually make sure that everyone's working really well together, too many bodies, too many agencies. Um, very much protecting, another priority is very much to protect critical information infrastructures in the Internet of Things. There's been a EU Cybersecurity Act created in 2020 that's introduced a certification scheme for cyber products, for digital products. Um, there's also a, a, an attempt to actually invest much more money than before. We've been promised that there's a digital year program taking place until 27 with, uh, 2027 with 1.9 billion euros going to be spent. Uh, don't hold your breath on that. I'm not sure that's going to happen. And there's a U toolbox on 5G to make sure that actually 5G is going to be running well and not be vulnerable to uh, external, uh, you know, other governments' uh, uh, attacks. Um, 
there's been also and try to actually focus on awareness of the public, creating a European Cybersecurity Month, trying to create a European Cybersecurity Challenge for students. In case you're interested, that's a really you know interesting one to have a look at. Obviously. There's also the issue that actually when you look at the cybersecurity challenge, you see that actually you only see male students there. So maybe, the, you know, the commission thought maybe we have a gender gap in cybersecurity. Maybe we have to actually pay attention to the women as well. And so they created the Women for Cyber. So it's basically a platform where you actually, if you happen to be a woman and you're interested in cyber, you put your uh, name there and they try to actually, you know, promote uh, your work. Um, there's also uh, more and more a uh, focus on cyber diplomacy and external relations. Basically, the EU wants the rest of the world to actually, you know, keep up with it. Basically, it wants to make sure that actually it's cooperating with third countries to prevent those cyber attacks. It's creating sanctions. It's actually trying to create cyber capacity building in other countries. And then there's the latest of the trends, which is really, really interesting one. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this one because I'm running out of time, but if you're interested, you can actually ask me questions about this. It's called the digital sovereignty trends. So over the past few years, uh, because of different attacks, so because of different data breaches, the EU has realized that actually the way forward is sovereignty. The way forward is autonomy and no more dependency on the US, on China, on Russia, on anyone else, basically. And so it wants to bring everything into, you know, home production, essentially. It wants to have the capacity to act completely independently in the digital world. Doesn't want to depend on American software, doesn't want to depend on Chinese software. It wants to actually build everything in-house and actually, you know, companies uh, that actually share the same norms, that share, share the same priorities, and actually are there to build the European Union's uh, cybersecurity uh, um, policy. Now, problems, just to finish this off. Um, <clears throat> the problems are essentially, as I mentioned before, that sometimes you know, um, prioritization and nice talk doesn't actually mean implementation. So if you look at the financial resources that have been put into cybersecurity in the EU, they are a little bit on the ridiculous side. <laughs> so if we look at the ENISA, which is the European Union cybersecurity, policy, uh, cybersecurity agency, so the main actor, it has a budget of 17 million euros. That's it, 17 million euros. And it has 65 staff, 65 staff for the entirety of the EU. It's, and that hasn't really changed that much over the years. If we look at 2012, it has 65 ta staff. When it was created in 2005, it has 65 staff. And uh, it's interesting to see what they, re what they say. If they say our coverage of technological change is minimal. I have one, perhaps two people who are experts in clouds. I have one person in industrial control systems, and that's quite a weak basis for the future. Well, you can say that again, that's terrible. <laughs> the EC3, which is part of Europol, the Cybercrime Center, uh, says that actually, well, it has a 10 million euro uh, budget and it has 50 staff, and that hasn't really evolved that much better. And so um, what it says is the question remains whether in terms of staffing, EC3 will be able to cope with the steep increase in its workload. They have 50 staff for the entirety of the EU to actually work at cybercrime. I rest my case. <laughs> the European External Action Service has a 519 million euro budget, which is much better, but this is a generic budget, not just for cyber. And if you look at the people who are working in cybersecurity, in the external action service until recently when I did my interviews there, they had four people, four people. So uh, not gonna go into the, into the rest of these, because there's a lot of figures. Uh, it's interesting to compare it with the American figures. You know, if you look at the Department of Defense, the US Cyber Command, Department of Homeland Security, obviously they're much, much, you know, some of them are in the billions, right? And so I thought, always think that actually Neely Cruz, which, who is an, a member of the European Parliament, got it really right when she said in 2013 that politicians in Europe need to recognize the importance of the digital economy and the benefits for society. I wish leaders had done so when discussing the EU's budgets. So basically putting, their, uh, 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 putting the money where their mouths are. So in a way, the problem continues to be the same one as when cybersecurity policy was created officially in 2013. It's a very fragmented field. It's got very different approaches depending which pillar you're looking at, lots of different initiatives, everything coming up all the time, but they're not really well integrated. They're not talking to each other. You've got 
too many actors dealing with cybersecurity, some of them not talking to each other, not cooperating, whether it's between the EU level actors or between the national level actors or between the EU and national actors. There's also the issue that member states sometimes uh, are not always on the same page. Some countries obviously have budgetary problems more than others. They might not want to invest as much in cybersecurity than other countries. There's also then, just to finish off, then the relations with NATO. What does the EU do in this area? What should NATO be doing in this area? There's, are there overlaps? Should they be working better together? Uh, there's also the issue of Brexit. I'm not going to go into this one because, although for me it's a very big problem, <laughs> because I'm in the UK, it might not be the same issue for you. There's lots of consequences of Brexit for cybersecurity policies, and I'm happy to talk, to talk to you about this in the question and answer if you're interested. So as a conclusion, uh, the EU is definitely paying much, attention, much more attention to cybersecurity. It's become one of the main areas of, cyber sec of, of security, but at the same time, we're having real problems achieving a coherent approach uh, in terms of the architecture of the policy, in terms of how much we're funding it, in terms of lack of cooperation, in terms of maybe some resistance of some member states. And so there is an attempt to actually fill this gap and produce a lot more policies, but the same problems continue to exist. And so thank you very much for this. I took one more minute than what I expected. Sorry about that. But I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Many, many thanks, uh, Elena. Congratulations. Very intriguing, interesting. Uh, um speech and talk regarding uh, cyber security and many and many uh, related uh, sectors that uh, could be affect uh, um, from the issue uh, i have uh, some questions but uh, i would like to to leave the floor uh, uh, first to students so starting from now you can raise uh, uh, virtually your hands uh, joel can help us in moderating the session do you have questions? Do you have uh, uh, some reaction? We have uh, almost 20 minutes that we can use for this Q&A session. While students think of their questions, uh, I forgot to actually give you an example of uh, when cybersecurity incidents actually happened very close to home. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in September last year, uh, it's uh, just to give you the example that universities can also be very hit and actually could be have it could have a real tangible impact. Uh, in September last year, the two universities in Newcastle, that's where I live, actually were hit by a major cyber attack. And uh, it was a ransomware type of attack. It means that the entirety, the entireties of the universities were shut down. And when I say the entireties of the university, I mean that we had no email no platforms to submit work, no uh, uh, platforms to run the, the classes. And at the time, all the classes were online. There was nothing happening physically. Um, we couldn't even get into the universities because the cards weren't working. And they couldn't get anything to work for an entire month. So can you imagine what it is for a cyber attack to actually bring down everything for an entire month? Uh, it was obviously reported to the... Um, to the uh, organized crime uh, agency in the UK, and we're still waiting for the results. So anonymity was obviously a very important issue. We still don't know who did it, but it really had a major impact on the uh, on the universities, on the students, and on the staff. And Elena, did did they ask for money? Did they was uh, economic uh, crime oriented? Yeah, it was. It was a. Uh, it was ransomware. So it's basically all the systems were locked down, and they asked for Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let me start me, me first, uh, and uh, meanwhile, students uh, are thinking about their uh, uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you raised lots of interesting questions. Just to to point out some of, of these, the first one when you mentioned politicians, no, and and the ignorance or the lack of interest is. I mean, it's not surprising uh, because I, I teach public policy and in many other uh, sectors that seems to be very technical. Uh, uh, sometimes we have this uh, uh, surprise, no, according to which politicians seems to be or to live in a different <laughs> in a different scenario. I mean, why they should uh, uh, take a uh, uh, relevant decision? That this is just a comment. The, the question is. Uh, uh, 
you mentioned that the majority of critical infrastructure is in the hands of uh, private actors, no? So I expect here that uh, private actors, yes, they do invest in cybersecurity because uh, it's 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 it's, it's an issue of I mean it, it can affect their profits and they can have stronger incentives. Uh, can you confirm these? I mean, what I'm trying to 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 or what I grasp from your is from your presentation is that from one side, as you mentioned, no, the the, the number presented for EU organization uh, uh, linked to cyber security is pretty ridiculous. Uh, so it seems that the European Union is not still investing as you expect. And the, the question are, first one, can you confirm that on the contrary, if firms and private sector, yes, they are taking seriously the, 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 the issue of cybersecurity and they are investing money. And also I expect, probably I'm, I'm pretty naive, but that member states, government, central governments, they also do spend money. Uh, I mean, the, 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 this is a question more related to uh, supranational coverage or or cyber secure of cyber security. Am I on the right tracks or uh, uh, many things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want me to respond directly, or do you want to collect more uh, questions? Uh, guys, we need your involvement. So uh, let's, uh, if you pref if you can uh, answer to me, and then we will gather uh, at least three, four questions from students. Very good. Right. So uh, yes, now that's a really good question uh, in terms of how much are is the cyber cyber. Uh, how much is the private sector really buying into the whole thing? So uh, the, question, the answer is depending on who we're talking about, right? So as I mentioned, indeed, most of the critical information infrastructures are in the hands of the private sector. So you have to work with the private sector. There is no way around it. You need to make sure that the private sector is on the same page in terms of how much this is a priority and how much they want to invest. Nowadays, yes, the private sector is always saying this is really important for us. The problem is that it stops there. So the issue is, um, who does the investment? Uh, so us, the private sector say, often says, and the most, there you, within the private sector, you have to differentiate between the large companies and those which are mostly affected, which are the medium and small sized companies. They don't really have the same capacity, obviously, to invest, right? So whereas the large companies are usually on board and there's not much of a problem, the medium and small companies are saying, we completely agree that there has to be investment. Can you give us some money, please? <laughs> That's basically the answer. Uh, so there's two issues there, there. The fact that actually the medium and small companies often don't have the capital to invest so much in cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, sometimes they feel that there has to be a balance between, uh, uh, you know, revenue and the investment in this area, which can be tremendous. And they always ask the, the state to actually support them whenever there's a data breach and they have to actually compensate users or compensate clients. Uh, and then there's also the, the fact that they are not particularly good at dealing with the human factor, right? The human factor within their, their own companies in terms of, uh, um, in terms of making sure that their employees are actually very well aware of what uh, they need to do, how they have to prevent what we call uh, cybersecurity hygiene, basically. What is it that, you know, what do you do with your personal computer at, at work to make sure that you're not going to be uh, hacked, for instance? So they're not very good at this. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the attacks, actually, a lot of the incidents come because uh, a lot of the computers have out of, uh, you know, not up to date software, or they haven't downloaded the latest patches. And so they have very old software. And so that's how a lot of the attacks actually, a lot of the data breaches happen through there. So yes, in the private uh, sector is actually, uh, you know, obviously wanting to actually prevent uh, uh, data breaches and having to compensate clients and, uh, you know, losses. But at the same time, it's sometimes hesitates to actually invest if they don't have much capital and more importantly and this is a really tricky part even nowadays they are very hesitant to share the idea to share the knowledge that they have been hacked 
So they don't want to share the, the, the fact that they've had data breaches because of competition. They don't want to look, obviously because of publicity, they don't want the users or the clients to know that, they've been, that they have vulnerabilities, that they actually are a risky company. And they also don't want the, uh, uh, the comp competitors to actually become aware that they actually are vulnerable and that they could be actually taken over in terms of market uh, uh, sectors. Um, in terms of national spending, absolutely. So I mentioned only the EU level because I just wanted to focus on the uh, European level, uh, but the majority of cybersecurity spending is indeed at national level. Um, so whereas, you know, I mentioned some of the uh, budgets of the main actors at EU level and some of the, men, you know, NISA, 65 staff. At national level, we're talking about many, many more, more people. But the problem is that it very much depends on the country, right? So if I think about the UK, the UK was actually passing cybercrime laws in the 80s already. Uh, you know, it was one of the first countries in Europe to do this. But if I think of Portugal, on the other hand, you know, we just have to go back 10 years and they didn't even have a cybersecurity center. It was doing very, very little. So the problem is consistency, co you know, coherence at the national level and making sure that everyone is able to actually invest the same amount of money to be able to actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, to go, you know, to identify vulnerabilities and actually tackle those vulnerabilities. And uh, not all countries are the same. Absolutely not. If you think about Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Portugal, they're very much the, uh, the weak link of cybersecurity at national level. I hope that answers. Thank you so much. I know that there's a, a there's a question here. Is that? Uh... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm not going to put my camera on because my internet's a bit rocky, so I might cut if I put my camera off, uh, camera on. But it was more of a comment to say how, like, even though everyone knows that, like, technical, uh, techno, sorry, technology is everywhere and there's internet everywhere. It's kind of surprising to see that there's 50 million internet, uh, I forgot the term that you used, internet of things, I think you said. It's like, you, you don't notice how important it is in every, even though you know, you don't realize to what point, to what extent, like when you were saying that even um, in the in the university in Newcastle, when there was the, the cyber attack, you couldn't even get into the building. You wouldn't think that it's to a point that you can't even get to a building. So that, that really puts everything in perspective. Like it shows how important you said that I think in a few years it would be 230 billion. The, the, that's the number of uh, people whose houses would be oh, okay. houses. Yeah. Well, that's a lot. So yeah, it's it's very impressive and it really puts things into perspective. Even though we already know how important it is, we don't see to what we don't understand to what extent. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I think it's it's how, uh, how ubiquitous, so how mm -hmm. embedded in your normal life it's all become, right? So one one funny exercise that I do when I have more time with students and I'm in the same room with them, I actually ask them to spend like two minutes or five minutes actually listing the number of devices they have on them and which are connected. And sometimes they can't think of all of them. And sometimes I kind of think, well, how about, you know, some of them have um, uh, obviously the usual one is a computer and your smartphone, right? But oh, exactly, that's what people mostly think of. Like the only, like even me, I wouldn't have thought of anything else. I think than rather uh, other than my phone or my computer. Because most people, well, depends who, but a lot of people have smartwatches or they'll have uh, devices that track their uh, steps uh, or when they do their exercise. Others will actually have devices that are, um, I used to have, this was a long time ago, about 15 years ago, uh, there was something called Nike Plus, so a pair of tennis shoes, yes. And they had devices in them. They had a chip in them that actually tracked, this was before smart, smart uh, watches. They used to track the number of steps you did and actually send the information to your phone. So, you know, this was a good example of a piece of clothing or, or shoes that were actually connected. And like this, uh, you have quite a lot of them. Uh, and you have to think about those people, for instance, who have medical issues and have devices that are connected uh, uh, for medical issues that make sure that, for instance, that identify if they have a heart issue, if the heart is slowing down, if there's an arrhythmia. So all that gets sent to your phone that then can actually, depending on, 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 on your preferences, can be connected directly to your doctor's uh, uh, system. So 
yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to actually just do a, a very simple exercise, which is sit down and actually understand how many of your devices are actually have sensors and are emitting uh, uh, data and collecting data from your daily life. Mm -hmm. I have another question. If someone has, for example, like a heart monitor or like a fake heart or something like that, and can someone hack into it? So that, that's something I didn't actually mention, but yes, absolutely, it can be hacked. So that's one of the big concerns is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's now possible to hack cars, planes, um, heart monitors, yes, uh, or, or um, uh, your fridge. <laughs> you never know, somebody can want to hack your fridge and order like 50 million <laughs> you know, bottles of milk for you. Uh, but you know, it's just, just a joke, obviously. But uh, it is possible to do that. And that's why it's, it's always a race between identifying vulnerabilities within those systems, uh, whether it's hardware or, or whether it's uh, software, and actually make sure that the you know, patches are being created all the time to cover those vulnerabilities. Uh, so it's always, it's always a race between those actually exploiting those vulnerabilities and those creating patches just for it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. I don't want to scare you, but you can still drive and take planes. <laughs> I have a question. Um, how has the introduction and the mainstreamization of cryptocurrencies uh, fueled uh, crime, cybercrime in the yeah. EU and in the US? Uh, has there been a surge in, in the rates? Thank you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, cryptocurrencies is, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but definitely it's been very much a, um, it's, it's very much used, uh, if I think from, a, from an organized crime perspective, basically every ransomware uses cryptocurrency essentially. And so it, it almost, for me, it's very much associated to organized crime uh, activities. And uh, it's, uh, and I think it, I'm not sure it's going to continue for much longer because I think cryptocurrencies people are becoming much more aware of the vulnerabilities of you know uh, of, of the fact that actually they're insecure of the fact that you can rip, be ripped off so I think people are getting a bit more cautious in terms of cryptocurrencies and more importantly there is more and more legislation so the EU is preparing a package of legislation in relation to cryptocurrency actually saying uh, you know uh, rendering it in practice illegal um, one of the, uh, for instance, that's not EU, that's UK, but the UK just passed a piece of legislation saying that actually it's now illegal to have uh, uh, ATMs, so cash machines, where you can withdraw money in cryptocurrency. So they're kind of somehow closing the loopholes little by little, and actually, uh, uh, you know, basically cryptocurrency is being pushed to the margins. It's being associated with organized crime only. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people who are very angry about that, obviously, who actually thought that the, the future of money was cryptocurrencies. But I, I you know, I, I work mainly from a cybercrime perspective. So for me, I think it's an important problem, you know, a step to do. I know we have only two minutes left because I, I know that you have to leave at uh, 50 past, but I'm still happy to actually answer any questions. Also happy to provide uh, reading lists if you want to um, on this topic. Obviously, it's still a very niche area from an academic perspective, but it's becoming very big very quickly. So if some of you are interested in doing master's degrees or even PhDs in the future, I think that actually cybersecurity, depending what independently from what area of cybersecurity you want to specialize in, it's very much uh, an area that's, uh, you know, it's booming. And uh, I have students who actually did uh, master's degrees with me about you know five years ago who did it already on cybersecurity and currently they're working for the commission uh, federal agencies in Germany for instance on cybersecurity Microsoft and they're already in very high positions because you know it's an area that not many people have expertise even now and so it's really uh, I think it's it's a good opportunity there to identify and to actually uh, pursue I think it's a great suggestion for those that are familiar with this. Uh, a very quick question if students uh, do not react. Uh, uh, um, in terms of military, in the military field, uh, leave us with uh, some safe uh, uh, final sentence. I'm thinking about the use of drone. I'm thinking about uh, no, the 
the frontier of uh, technological knowledge that probably is unknown for uh, for uh, for normal citizens as has no but I, I i i expect that the most innovative field is the military one in in this uh, in uh, in in this uh, in this context uh, our um, military yeah. ministries uh, of defense of our states uh, uh, really prepared in this field. Uh, I expect, of course, now that there will be lots of variance among uh, less rich and uh, more rich countries. So the issue will will uh, will be there for many years for for those countries that have more or less resources, but. Uh, for for the Western world, for yeah. example, yeah. I mean, uh, how is the the scenario? I I think there is. Uh, I I won't be able to tell you how prepared they are. I won't be able to actually tell you because obviously the 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 knowledge of vulnerabilities of the military is not a public well known area, right? Uh, but uh, what I can tell you though is that the amount of investment that is being done especially now at the moment in light of the Ukraine Russia situation is tremendous basically so uh, uh, you know countries have in, in, in dramatically increased the number of spending in terms of military in the area of cyber defense more importantly uh, it, I think it will be important to actually say when I mentioned I mentioned the figure uh, 1.9 billion that the Commission is hoping to spend uh, as you in general between now and 2027. A good part of that is on military technology. Now, there's a caveat to that. It's that actually it's not for military affairs as you may think they are, because what's happened is that there's been a militarization. And if you work on borders, you, you might know that there's a militarization of border protection, uh, border control. And so a lot of, you know, you mentioned drones a lot of the drones, a lot of the defense companies in Europe are actually producing technology, surveillance technology for border controls, which means that actually um, it's it's not really for the same purpose. We think, you know, you'd mentioned it's to prevent cyber attacks from other countries, but actually what a lot of it is being done is actually to surveil borders and actually prevent the, ent the, the, the entrance of uh, uh, migrants, asylum seekers. So, um, it, it really is, it reflects a lot the priorities of the member states at the moment uh, with the current governments and of the commission as well. So it's all has to do with what is the current priority. Many thanks, uh, Elena, very clear, clear enough. Uh, okay, so if there are not more questions, uh, uh, many, many, many thanks, I think that's you, you gave us uh, an interesting uh, overview, uh, lots of inspiring uh, uh, elements in order to think uh, much more seriously uh, uh, regarding uh, cybersecurity and the impact that this issue will have in our life and in, the, in, in our public policy. So many, many thanks, congratulations. It was uh, really a pleasure uh, to have uh, you with us in our, in our course. And I really hope to see you here in uh, Barcelona as soon as possible. It will be a real pleasure. Thank you again for uh, inviting me. And I hope you all enjoy the talk. Also happy to answer any questions by email you might have. So don't hesitate to be in touch. Thank you, Lena. Uh, it's been a pleasure also on our behalf of uh, Bathes to invite you to this, uh, to this seminar and let's keep in touch Perfect. thank you thank you bye 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 everyone stay safe bye bye